third program in the Kansas and Missouri Cancer Research Highlight Series hosted by the Masonic Cancer Alliance and the KU Cancer Center. On behalf of the MCA and the KU Cancer Center, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. January is really tough, we understand that, so we really appreciate your presence. Dr. Tara Lynn is going to moderate if we can get some of the technology issues sorted out, but in the meantime, I'm gonna pinch it for her. Um, just wanna make a uh, remind all of you that this is a Zoom session that's being recorded. Uh, all of our participants remain muted throughout the program. If you'd like to ask a question, please place it in the chat box. We have uh, dedicated staff that will be looking at the questions and will pose those questions to our presenters. If you have any technical difficulties during the program, please post them in the chat and we'll try to help you if we can. Um, finally, be sure that all your questions and comments do not contain any uh, uh, patient information or any identifiable information. And with that, why don't we get started with uh, Dr. Barry Skickney. Dr. Skickney is Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology, Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapeutics at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. His clinical interests focus on hematologic malignancies as well as acute myeloid leukemia, anemia, coagulation disorder, disorders and cytopenias. His research interest includes issues related to hematologic malignancies. Dr. Skickney knew me as a medical student, a resident, and as a fellow. Uh, so he has some dirt on me, but just so we're all clear, I have some on him as well. Uh, and with that, Dr. Skickney, welcome, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Doolittle. And so the, the, the presentation today, I think, it, it is mainly related to advances in hematological malignancies in the past 50 years. And I think Dr. Doolittle asked me to, to be one of the talkers because I, I've lived the past 50 years and, and I'm going to talk about some of my experiences if you want. Um, and so, so if we go to the next slide and um, so if you look at, you know, what's happened in, in the past 50 years and I'm not going to be able to cover every possible aspect, but just giving, going to give some highlights. So the one thing is related to the biology of the disease. And if we go to the next, and, and then it, there's the development of therapies um, to treat patients. And the third thing is the evolution of supportive therapies that have been extremely necessary to, to help patients get through the, the treatments we give them. And so if we, the next slide, please. So as far as the biology of diseases, then the next, the next. Um, so, you know, there've been significant advances in these past 50 years that have allowed us to learn all about the pathways that are involved in, in, in some of the diseases that we deal with, um, in fact, in all of them, basically. Um, and these include things like immunohistochemistry advances, use of chromosome analyses, and later fluorescence in cyto -hybrid, hybridization. Then in the 1980s, flow cytometry came about. And it's quite interesting how this has advanced from um, huge uh, uh, laser machines that almost fitted into a room to small bench type instruments that are uh, uh, that we use today. Um, and then further great advances, especially in the past 10, 15 years have been related to the ability to look at gene mutations that occur in these different diseases and maybe drive them and influence the prognosis of of, of, of the diseases. And, and more, more recently, the development of immune checkpoint, checkpoint uh, knowledge and, and how the, the immune system really plays an important role um, that we're gonna hear about, especially from Dr. Dr. McGurk in his talk. So if we go to the next slide, then as far as the development of therapies are, are concerned, and if, if the next please. And so, you know, th there have been significant advances in, 
chemotherapy. And if one wants to look at this as non-specific type therapies, and then more recently, the development of targeted therapies. Um, and there've been some fantastic advances. And one of the major ones that we've dealt with, certainly in the hematological sort of sphere, has been in CML. And Dr. Jakub is going to give us an update in, in that arena. And, and there also been the advancement and, and dis the discovery and, adv and advancement of the use of monoclonal antibody type therapies. And under this, we can also include radio immunotherapy, label, radio labeling the monoclonal antibodies with specific uh, 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 ra radiation type uh, uh, treatments that targeted to the disease and um, the checkpoint inhibitors. There have been great advances as far as radiation therapy and then bone marrow transplantation. And I'm going to uh, really uh, place most of the, the rest of the talk in this arena. But if we go to the next slide, then what about the evolution of supportive care? And if we hit the next, so, you know, back in 50 years ago, we had very limited uh, uh, use or, or uh, um, uh, um, ability to, to have any antibiotics that we use today. We, we had penicillins and the early penicillins, tetracycline, sulfur derivatives, and the, the, you know, the, 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 the early cephalosporin type antibiotics. As far as antifungal therapies, we had amphotericin B, which was very difficult to, to, to administer to patients because of the side effects, but also it, its efficacy was also limited. And there were no antiviral therapies whatsoever. Acyclovir was one of the first antiviral therapies that came about in the 1980s. And also no growth factors, no no no. Um, GCSF or, G, or, or ESAs or, or, or thrombopotin stimulating agents at all. So, so we had very limited ability to, to at those, in those days to treat patients in a highly effective manner as we know today. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to spend most of the time now talking about bone marrow transplantation. And you see, I've also got another term, the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which is now the preferred uh, a, a term to use in a way. So in before 1970, if you want, um, and this is in, you know, people were trying to work out how to do bone marrow transplantation. And really the first successful allogeneic bone marrow transplants were reported in 68 to 1969 in patients with severe, severe combined immunodeficiency disorders. And it was only in about 1974 that the first successful bone marrow transplants were starting to, to, to come about. And these transplants were done in patients with acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemias, and in pa some patients with aplastic anemias. And at that time, the mant mantra was to give industrial strength chemotherapy with high doses of cyclophosphamide and total body ir irradiation to obliterate the patient's bone marrow, if you want, and the, the, the underlying malignancy that one was trying to treat and replace it with the cells from a, a, a donor. And at, those in, at that time, these patients, because of a lack of good matching, HLA typing wasn't really invented yet or, or used, invented for use in, in bone marrow transplantation. There was work on this um, in, for use in, in kidney uh, renal, uh, renal uh, transplants. Um, and so there were problems with graft versus host disease, horrendous graft versus host disease, it's both acute and chronic that would be occurred in those days. And there was also an increased problem with rejection of bone marrow 
um, in, in those early days um, after administration. So if we go to the next slide, and this slide, just this figure just depicts um, what happens in, you know, the, the transplantation um, where, where you had your a patient who, who was given the industrial strength chemotherapy. Um, early on, the only treatment was with cyclophosphamide and total body irradiation. But later on, busulfan and cyclophosphamide came about being used. And early on, the busulfan was given as tablets. Intravenous busulfan was not yet invented. And so patients would have to, to take numerous busulfan tablets to get the adequate doses that were required. Um, and then um, patients would undergo the, the stem cell transplantation. And as far as immunosuppression was concerned, as for graft versus host disease, we gave methotrexate at the time of transplant, and then we had corticosteroids. There weren't any other treatments to use for graft versus host disease, which I'll come to. And if we go to the next slide. So this is important work that was noted now. In the late 70s to early 80s, it was recognized that if you did transplants in the three um, diseases we're talking about, Patients who happen to have a, 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 a monocyte, a, 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 a full twin, and who was transplanted from a full twin, um, had significant problems with relapse of their underlying disease compared to patients who underwent allogeneic transplantation. And if patients develop graft versus host disease after their allogeneic transplantation, it was recognized that the relapse rate was significantly reduced. If there wasn't any graft versus host disease, that's the middle uh, line there. Um, yes, there was reduction in the incidence of relapse of these diseases, but not as severely as you, one would see if graft versus host disease was seen. And this led to the recognition and the, the, the term graft versus leukemia. And that's an important sort of first step in, and it's in the evolution of where we are today. And it's still in great evolution, which you're gonna to come to, and you're gonna hear again from Dr. McGurk around this area. So next slide, please. So this source of stem cells for transplantation in those early days are noted in this red box that if you had identical twin transplants, but not everybody had an identical twin, and then uh, a matched sibling or, or, or uh, 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 transplants. And I've got the HLA matched and HLA mismatched, because we're going to come to this in, 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 in a few minutes. Then later on, about in the, in the 1980s, autologous stem cell transplant came about. And beyond that, then people started to try and use peripheral blood stem cell harvesting. And then later on, the, the match unrelated donor transplants came about. The use of donor lymphocyte infusions when it was again recognized about this graft versus leukemia effect, if a patient was relapsing, if one harvested lymphocytes from the original donor or, or another matched donor and gave those lymphocytes back to the patient whose leukemia was relapsing, some of those went back into remission or they, they, they came into a stable state as far as their leukemia was concerned. Um, and, and then the other thing that important sort of step in the evolution is umbilical cord stem cell transplantation and most recently haploidentical transplantation. Um, so we go to the next slide. And so in the early days, we used mixed lymphocyte cultures to see if there was a match between the donor and the patient. 
Um, but these were crude tests and probably about 50% of those where one saw that there was a mismatch, they probably weren't a mismatch. Um, and if, if there wasn't a mismatch, they probably were a mismatch. Uh, uh, we're compatible. So it's like a flip of a coin in a way that, that one we learned later on that you know this was a really crude and useless test. And unfortunately, again, HLA typing came about and this was especially developed by Dr. Paul Terasaki, who was at the UCLA, and he set up a tissue typing uh, a, a system for organ transplantation. Again, this was mainly the work, most of the work was for kidney transplantations, but this was then a, a, a device for use in patients undergoing bone marrow transplants. So in the early days, in, in the early 80s, we would send samples of blood from the donor and the patient to the UCLA for, for testing by Dr. Terasaki and, and in, as far as HLA matching. And this has come a, a long way from how they were even done back then. And so, there were no treatment for acute graft versus host disease, as I had mentioned. But fortunately, um, in about 1983, cyclosporin first became available for organ transplantation. Um, and it was noted that it may dampen down the, the, the bad effects that one may see with graft versus host disease and even perhaps have a, 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 a prophylactic effect in preventing acute graft versus host disease from coming on. And it's interesting. We didn't know how, you know, one gave a, a, a single dose and, and scheduled uh, of cyclosporin. One didn't know about that you had to adjust the doses um, according to blood levels of cyclosporin, which came about the um, testing for blood levels came up, came about in the late 80s, where now we could see um, if there was adequate cyclosporin levels in the patient. If not, we, you, you could up the dose, or if the dose was too high, and, and, and when you have very high levels of cyclosporin, there are a number of other complications that happen from those high levels. You get renal dysfunction, for instance. There's always problems with magnesium levels so, and neurological problems, just to mention some of, the, uh, some of them. And, and also, you, you are causing significant immunosuppression of the patient and increase the, increasing the risk of infections. So, and so that brings me on to the next piece. As far as the infection risk, it's interesting. Initially, laminar airflow rooms weren't used, and, and they started to be coming to, to use at in Seattle in the early 80s. Um, and we at KU, we only got laminar airflow rooms in about 1982 or 83. Um, and we would transplant patients on the floor, they would come and be on the floor with about six or eight other patients. And it's quite amazing that one in that, we started the program at KU in 1977, and we still have one of the patients that's alive um, from 1977 who was treated on the floor. Um, and and um, in, out of interest, he subsequently became a nurse and that's what he still, he still works as a nurse in, in, in another state. So if we go to the next slide, so laminar airflow rooms were used because of the increased risk of infections that were happening and, and they certainly did make some difference um, for the patient. And so in those days, um, we would take patients to the, the, uh, um, the, uh, the uh, surgical theaters and they would undergo repeated and, and numerous bone marrow aspirates and you, um, in order to get sufficient numbers of stem cells. Um, and you may recognize that this was the team, the, the transplant team back harvesting cells. And you may recognize the, the, the doctor in the middle there 
um, and you can see some just some uh, ginger beard that he, he was uh, showing off in those days. So, um, and that's Dr. Doolittle right there. So we can go on to the next slide. So one other thing that was in the early days in doing transplants in patients with acute myeloid leukemia, most of the transplants were being done in patients who had relapse or resistant disease. And, or, or they'd relapse, they got back into remission a few times, and then they, they were candidates for a transplant. And you can see they are represented by the teal line or light blue line and the red line. That's the survival over time. And the, versus patients who were treated and went into remission, if, if they treated for their leukemia, went into remission and then went for transplantation during first remission. And that's the yellow line. And these are some of the results. Um, and you can, uh, at, in our program um, in, in, before about 2005. So you can see the difference. And this was classical sort of results or outcomes that was being uh, uh, represented or, 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 or shown by different uh, transplant groups. So it was recognized if you're going to do a transplant, you want to do it early. You want to do it before res a relapse happens. Um, uh, otherwise, you're going to land up like the, the teal and the red uh, uh, survival curves are showing there. So let's go to the next slide. So the first successful autologous transplant. Now, this was a, a huge uh, 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 um, sort of outshoot from the autologous transplants was can you use the patient's own bone marrow for transplantation? So the first successful transplants came about in, in the early 1980s and we set up uh, doing autologous transplants at KU in 1984. And these were done in patients with Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas initially. Later on, about eight to 10 years later, we started doing transplants for patients with multiple myeloma. And what some of the problems that we were dealing with in those old days was poor marrow engraftment. And this was related to patients having numerous chemotherapy regimens and cycles before they were ever harvested. So by the time they came in to a transplant program, to undergo a transplant, they, stem, they had reduced stem cell numbers and or function from and related to all the prior treatments that were given to the patient. So that was another learning experience. And then subsequently, um, uh, in, and another interesting thing, in order to test if we had sufficient numbers of stem cells, we, we would do stem cell cultures, colony forming units, G, uh, which took about two weeks. You take the patient's bone marrow, put it in a special culture medium, and, and you had to wait two weeks to see if there were adequate myeloid colonies growing. And then you'd know if you saw adequate numbers, then you knew you had sufficient numbers of stem cells to do a transplant. And sometimes you'd have to go back and harvest a second time um, and maybe a third time to try and get adequate numbers that you'd know would work and the patient's marrow would recover after transplantation. So we go to the next slide. So in the early 1990s, peripheral blood stem cell harvesting came about. And this was made a, a huge difference in that you didn't have to take a patient to the operating theater to harvest their bone marrow. One could mobilize stem cells from the bone marrow with growth factors such as GCSF or GMCSF. And subsequently, the plerixophore has come about and another potent uh, immobilizer, if you want, of stem cells. So this made a huge difference and time, time and, and, and saved a lot of time in a way um, and, 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 and made it much easier for patients to undergo harvesting. And so initially, there were 
the peripheral stem cell harvests were only done in patients undergoing autologous transplants, but then it soon came into vogue and use in patients who were donating cells um, for allergenic transplantation. And then later on, which was another great boon, was the development of flow cytometry for counting CD34 cells in what we were harvesting. So that made a big difference. We didn't, we had to, we, we could now abandon the cell culture, uh, uh, cell cultures to, to, to ensure that you had sufficient number of stem cells. We could now just do a flow cytometry on harvested samples and, and know if we had adequate stem cells. So next slide. And, and this was just showing back in 1994, one of the early uh, uh, studies showing the, 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 the CD34 cells as the markers of stem cells coming into the, into the bloodstream. You could find them in, in adequate numbers on about day three after four days of CD34, uh, uh, sorry, of GCSF uh, in, in injections. And, and you'd hit a peak on about the fourth day and then after about seven days, the counts were, were the CD34 counts were, were dropping off significantly. Next slide. And we used apheresis. This is one of our patients type technologies for collecting the stem cells from the patients. Next slide. So the National Marrow Donor Program came about in the late 1980s, and it was only in the 1990s that the use of non-family HLA match donors came about, match unrelated donor transplant program came about. Uh, so now you didn't, you, if you didn't have a family donor, you could find donors uh, uh, elsewhere who weren't family donors. And, and this is a fantastic program that allowed most patients, not all, but most patients to find a donor, um, maybe not even in the US, that could be in another country uh, 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 where the, there was, you could find a, a match. And I'd mentioned umbilical cord blood stem cell transplantation in about the early 2000s, it's still used. It has some problems. Uh, related to it, but it's it, it's certainly another avenue to use. And I just want to mention that early on, patients would have to be below the age of fifty to have to get a transplant. And this age has steadily increased to now in the USA and certain other countries, seventy five years of age is okay. And this is related to all the, the great technologies and techniques and, and supportive care type uh, uh, programs that have come about to allow patients up to 75 to get a transplant. And we would mentioned earlier about the early observations of graft versus leukemia effect to control malignancy. And this led to new treatment modalities and especially in the transplant arena was the re development of a reduced intensity or non-myeloablative type transplantation. Next slide, we almost done. Um, where one can use uh, low levels of chemotherapy, like l smaller amounts of busulfan and, and low levels of total body irradiation or Another uh, 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 would be fludarabine and low doses of busulfan um, in order to prevent rejection of a donor cells by the patient. And what, what this slide is showing, um, the patient's own marrow cells are in yellow, the red are from the donor. So if you can prevent rejection, you'll have a mixture, a mixed chimerism, if you want, a mixture of the donor cells and the patient cells. And slowly over time, maybe in, in a few months to six months, the, the donor cells take over the patient's bone marrow. And hopefully in, they'll have an effect. The, the immune cells that are generated 
from those donor marrow cells then attack the, the underlying malignancy. And so you get this graft versus leukemia effect with this type of transplant. Um, and next slide. And that's really going to lead into the talk that we're going to hear from Dr. McGurk. So just a story of what happened in the past 50 years from 1970 to 2020, just highlighting some of the, the main change, main features that came about to allow us to get to where we are at now. We still have a long way to go and we'll hear more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Skickney. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Tara Lynn, and I'm gonna be helping to moderate this session. Um, Ashley, uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Skickney? Um, right now, we do not have any questions. I think in the interest of time, I think we gave Dr. Cover 50 years of transplant uh, very quickly. Um, we can go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Um, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Yacoub. Dr. Yacoub is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapeutics at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. His clinical interests focus on bone marrow failure syndromes, myelodysplastic syndrome, leukemia, myeloproliferative disorders, and pregnancy-related hematologic disorders. His areas of research are focused on myelodysplastic syndrome, leukemia, and especially the myeloproliferative disorders. Dr. Yacoub, we appreciate you presenting today. Thank Welcome. you so much, uh, Tara, and thank you, Gary, and the MCA team for the invitation and this wonderful event. Um, and I can't think of a better example than CML as an example of success in, in our management of blood cancers over the last two decades. Um, next slide. Um, I can summarize the whole presentation today with this one slide. This is a, an individual patient in my clinic who tells us the whole story. Next. So the patient presented in the dark ages, that's 1999, uh, when we had hydroxyurea as a treatment for CML. He was 42 that's, uh, and he was di just diagnosed with chronic, uh, chronic phase of CML. He was offered supportive care in hydroxyurea. And then he was brave enough to enroll in the iris clinical trial. So he received dematinib, a medicine that was not known at the time, it was randomized against hydroxyurea, sertraline, and interferon. He, uh, obviously, everybody is aware of the results. This was a very positive study that changed the whole uh, history of medicine and history of, of, of CML. He responded to imatinib expectedly and achieved a very good clinical response. In 2007, he lived long enough uh, on therapy that it was very, very successful. However, he has side effects to therapy. And by then, a second generation was approved. And at the time, he was switched to a medicine called the satin. Uh, shortly after it was approved, he responded to the satin and achieved a very good response. Next. And then this brings us to the golden era of uh, CML. So 2018, the patient, two decades into his diagnosis, he achieved a very deep response. He has, has successful therapy. He was offered a discontinuation of therapy. And three years later now, he remains off therapy. He remains in complete remission and in deep molecular remission. He has an excellent quality of life and he's likely going to live his natural life and die of old age. Next slide. So this is the finish line. So what, what is CML? CML is a, is a myeloproliferative neoplasm. It's the hallmark of the disease is the uh, translocation chromosome 922 leading to the Philadelphia chromosome named after the city when it was discovered in, in 1960. That's 60 years ago. Next. And then that was the first incidence where we were able to identify a blood cancer to the molecular event that led to it. And that molecular event leads to a BCR and EBL gene product uh, mixed in a chimeric protein that does not exist in nature called the BCR ABL. This BCR ABL is responsible for all the disease manifestations that you can see on that slide on the left. Uh, patients present with um, Significant constitutional symptoms, big spleen, rising white cell count, and, and illness. 
And then, next slide. So here's what happened in the last 50 years. Um, patients in the 60s and 70s were expected to live under five years with this level of therapy. Patients now can expect a life expectancy that is close to the normal peers, as we can see in the dashed line. Next. So what made that difference? So imatinib, the first tyrosine kinase inhibitor, was discovered in 2001 after that famous study, the IRIS study. So since then, five such drugs have been discovered and they're now in clinical use. These drugs have made the life expectancy of patients diagnosed with CML in 2020 equivalent to a patient who never had cancer. Next slide. And to see how patients fail over the last decades, each line represents a patient at a different time era. The top three lines represent patients who were diagnosed with CML in the, ABC, in the TKI era, in the, after imatinib was approved. Those patients have a life expectancy that is comparable to normal individuals, and the most common cause of death in these patients is not cancer. They die of non-cancer-related etiology, which basically undoes the, um, the, the, the impact of CML on their lifespans. Next. So we also have tools to predict this. We actually have very well-validated scoring systems that predict patients' uh, survival. They predict their risk of transformation. They predict the response to therapy. They predict their relapse 20 years after the diagnosis. They're very powerful tools that can predict patients who do well, who can receive standard therapy, and patients who are likely not to, and they will receive, uh, or they will require to receive more aggressive therapy. The prognostic system continues to get more complicated and more sophisticated and more helpful. Next. Now, our therapies work in a very specific way. They're designed drugs, targeted therapy. They're the literal form of targeted therapy. They were designed to block a tyrosine kinase domain on that chimeric protein, and they, they completely blocked the, the activity of that protein and result in undoing the cancer manifestations. Um, they achieve such a genetic, molecular, and clinical responses. And some responses are deep enough where patients can go into sustained long-term remission without maintaining those drugs. Next. So our understanding and our tools have improved over time. So now we utilize PCR as a measurement of the test of the cancer burden in these patients. We have uh, mainstream this testing. We have very specific milestones for patients to achieve. We know that if patients achieve a 0.1% or 1,000th of their starting tumor burden, that they will live a normal life expectancy. We know that patients who achieve a deep work response, that's more than one in 10,000, can actually sustain their disease without therapy. We, we, we call that deep work remission. So we can correlate the depth of response with the patient's outcomes, and we can predict the future accordingly. Next slide. And this resulted in a very well-validated milestone um, uh, tables. There's many of those, and those are present in our guidelines. We have expectations of our patients to respond and to follow this, these milestones, just like you expect your child to look at, at, at age of one, you expect your CML to be in, in molecular remission by the first year their treatment. Next. And then this resulted in our straightforward NCCN guidelines. So this page is, is taken from the NCCN guidelines. We treat patients with low-risk disease in a, in a, in a um, with utilization of imatinib more, more liberally. However, patients with high risk, based on their scoring systems, we utilize a more modern or higher potency, second generation uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, these agents are likely to respond uh, in, in, in a more robust way and likely to result in a, in a better clinical outcome. However, if you see on the table on the right, uh, patients continue to do extremely well whichever way they, they were treated. So patients who received imatinib or second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors continue to expect a high, more than 90% overall survival in five years. Next. So how do these newer agents um, um, uh, offer a better outcome for those patients. So they are likely to result in a more deeper response and more rapid response. 
So the first table, the first graph you see is from the desatinib clinical trial. Next. This is the nilotinib clinical trial. Next. And this is the busutinib clinical trial. So all three agents result in a deeper, faster remission that is more sustained and likely to give to patients where they need to be faster than imatinib will be. Next. So how do we choose between them? Each medication has a different side effect profile. So now we don't purely choose based on medical need. We actually choose based on which drug, fits, 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 which patient, which is the core of individualized therapy or personal therapy. So we can choose the tyrosine kinase that has the best profile that fits the best patient and gives them the least amount of toxicity that has been very well studied and well demonstrated. Next. So what's happening now? So we've talked about the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We've had tyrosine kinase inhibitors for 20 years now. They're very reliable and very effective. But that's all we had is tyrosine kinase inhibitors. The next wave of drugs are the targeted ABL inhibitors or the STAMP inhibitors. One of the um, most advanced uh, medications in, in clinical trials is Asiminib. Next. So asimilib was studied in third line sitting and it was superior to uh, busutinib and more likely to work faster and deeper. And now it's, it's getting more momentum earlier upstream in the treatment of CML. So now we have none TKI options for our patients. Next. And then we understand cancer dynamics much better right now. So patients with CML have a very heterogeneous response to the majority will respond, not all of them. Some of them will be primary refractory, 10%. But for most of the rest, will respond to therapy. Some of them will respond fairly. Some of them will respond very robustly and quickly and deeply. Some of them will so respond so robustly that they can be offered therapy, discontinuation of their therapy. So 25% of all comers, now probably closer to 35% of all comers, can expect a therapy that will end at one point and the patients will remain in a treatment-free remission, meaning their cancer is in remission, the therapy has been discontinued and they live without cancer and without cancer therapy. Next. And we can also understand the reasons why patients make it to that cut and some don't. So we have a multi-variable model to, to predict who's going to do well and who's going to do less well and who's going to require more aggressive therapy. Next. To summarize, we have gained um, major momentum in our understanding of CML. Uh, there's a lot more to learn. However, patients who are diagnosed in 2020 should expect a normal life expectancy that different from patients without cancer. Um, and some patients will actually enjoy remission without cancer therapy altogether. Um, better therapy is coming, and I have not even scratched the surface of allogenic stem cell transplant, which remains curative in patients who fail all the medical therapy. So thank you very much. I hope I convinced you about the success we've achieved in CML therapy as a great model for success in cancer care. Thank you, Dr. Yacoub. In the interest of time, uh, we'll move uh, to our last speaker and save our questions uh, for the end. Our final program speaker is Dr. Joseph McGurk. Uh, he is a professor of medicine at the University of Kansas Cancer Center and the Shudi Spies Professor of Hematology and Oncology in the, in the Division Director of the Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapeutics Program. He is the Medical Director of the Blood and Marrow Transplant Program as well. His clinical and research interests focus on blood and marrow transplantation, leukemia, lymphoma, and cellular <laughs> immunotherapy. Welcome, Dr. McGurk. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin, and thank you uh, for all of you who are in attendance, um, uh, and thank you for the organizers for allowing me this opportunity. My talk is going to be a follow-on to the talk that Dr. Uh, that Dr. Um, Skinkney gave uh, in uh, leveraging that knowledge that we gained about the ability of T cells in the context of an allogeneic stem cell transplant to attack and kill cancer cells, and uh, taking that knowledge to the laboratory and further engineering those T cells so, they, so that they would do an even better job. And that's given rise to this CAR-T uh, revolution in cancer therapeutics. And I'm going to demonstrate to you that this is indeed uh, revolutionary therapy. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. Next slide, please. Uh, 
And so let me just very briefly in this cartoon depiction, uh, walk you through how these cells are made. Here's a patient in the middle. Uh, we collect a blood from that patient. In that blood are T cells, among many other types of cells, sent to the laboratory. The T cells are selected out and they are gene transduced. So a gene cassette with four different genes to create this car construct, which is a completely artificial construct, doesn't exist in nature outside of this work in the laboratory, that can be made to recognize anything sticking out on the surface of a cell attached to it and then attack it, destroy the cell to which it's attached. Those cells are then expanded. Uh, they're sent back to the clinic and infused like a blood transfusion in, into the patient in need. Next slide, please. This has given rise to a lot of excitement over the uh, last five years in particular. And you can see in 2018, CAR T cell therapy was named as the uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology Advance of the Year. Publications in Nature and Science, Science Translational Medicine, uh, and some of the lay press as well, um, uh, because this is uh, really a quite exciting and successful story. Next slide, please. So is it worth uh, all of the excitement uh, and, uh, and all of the uh, media attention that I've mentioned to you uh, and the uh, scientific literature uh, that's focused in this area? Well, let me, uh, let me allow you to be the judge. Here are data on adults with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a form of a very aggressive uh, acute leukemia. Uh, and these are outcomes of patients who have relapsed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Two large studies on the left-hand side, an American British study on the right-hand side, French data. In total, both of these slides uh, are more than a th represent more than a thousand patients. So what's the survival in patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia who relapse, even in the context of being able to get back into remission and go to bone marrow transplant, it's absolutely devastating. 80 to 90% of these patients have died by one year after a diagnosis of relapse. The only long-term survivors, and there are far and few between, are those patients that we can get back into remission and take into transplant. So the expectation is these patients are going to die and they're going to die quickly. Next slide, please. So in that context, two trials of CAR T cells. Now, interestingly, these are not allogeneic using somebody else's donor a, a, as a donor of the T cells. Oh, that is an area of focus and interest, a research interest. But no, these are the patient's own T cells. So the patients are brought to the laboratory, collect their T cells that were not doing the job of controlling their leukemia, engineering them in the way that I just showed you a moment ago in the laboratory and infusing them back into the patients. On the left-hand side here, 75 children, adolescents, and young adults. Uh, interestingly, more than 60% of these patients had relapsed after a prior stem cell transplant. And so their outcomes are expected to be worse than those that I just showed you in the last slide uh, in patients with relapsed acute lymphoblastic leukemia. In this setting, CAR T cell therapy brought about 80% complete remissions. That's unprecedented in this population of patients. The survival was significantly improved. 90% of these patients were alive at six months and 76% at 12 months in contrast uh, to the single digits uh, to 15% uh, 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 I showed you in the last slide. Well, what about real adults, not just kids and adolescents? That's represented on the right-hand side uh, of this slide. 53 adult patients were reported from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. Median follow-up now well beyond uh, three years, and a third of these patients had failed a prior stem cell transplant. And here again, in the adults, same types of outcomes, 83% complete remissions and remarkable um, overall survivals not previously realized. Next, that, these results gave rise to the first approval of a genetically modified T cell construct in the history of our nation uh, in 2017 and represents now a standard of care therapy available to patients uh, in the commercial sector for relapsed acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Next. This is Emily Whitehead, one of the first uh, patients treated in the United States with CAR T cell therapy for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She was in big trouble in the intensive care unit trying to die on multiple uh, medications to support her blood pressure. It was discovered that she had an inflammatory molecule in her bloodstream called IL-6. And one of the researchers' daughter, uh, daughters had rheumatoid arthritis and was receiving a drug called tocilizumab, which blocks IL-6 
uh, and its activity at the cell level. Emily was given that drug and here Emily is year after year after year. And now she's, I, this is not recently updated, eight years out, she attends our national meetings and she's a national spokesperson for CAR T cell therapy for acute leukemia. Next slide, please. What about the most common form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in adults in the United States, diffuse large cell lymphoma? What happens to those patients when they relapse? So they've received their primary therapy and now they're in relapse uh, and they're not responding uh, to more chemotherapy or they've uh, gotten a stem cell transplant and relapsed. Well, those data are represented here in two large phase three trials, two observational cohorts, over 600 patients, median survival. If you have relapsed uh, diffuse large cell lymphoma, not responding to chemotherapy, median survival, six months, only 7% have a complete response to any subsequent therapy and only 16% are surviving at two years. So again, a very devastating outcome for this population of patients. Next slide, please. So in this context, uh, next, uh, three uh, prospective phase one, two trials, Zuma one, Juliet and Transcend, different CAR T constructs, next. Over 400 patients in total with diffuse large cell lymphoma, next. And in this population of patients, overall response rates up to 83%, complete response rates ranging from 40 to 58%. And with longer term follow-up, the majority of these patients who went into complete remission remain in complete remission. The longest follow-up is in the Zuma-1 trial, uh, now almost four years median follow-up. Uh, and again, the majority of those patients who went into remission and continued complete remission. Next. These results also led to the first FDA approval of CAR T cell therapy for large cell lymphoma based on the Zuma-1 and Juliet trials and FDA um, uh, uh, consideration pending for the construct used in the Transcend trial. Next slide, please. Well, these are clinical trials and we select patients very carefully and specifically for clinical trials. They have to be fit. They have to have good kidney liver function. Uh, and they couldn't have central nervous system involvement. So what about in the real world? Now we've got commercial approval. So now we can look at a large population of patients who received the commercial construct and ask the question, do they do as well as the patients in the clinical trial? And the answer is yes. We co-authored this uh, manuscript uh, at University of Kansas Cancer Center, uh, published in Journal of Clinical Oncology um, just this past year on 300 patients uh, who received CAR T cell therapy and the outcomes for these patients in terms of progression-free survival, overall survival, and durability of response are superimposable on those from the clinical trial. And that's a remarkable result. And the reason it's a remarkable result is half of these patients would not have qualified for entry into the clinical trial data I showed you just a moment ago. So this is working in the real world uh, as well. Next slide, please. Next. So here's a major challenge to the field. Um, of the 25,000 patients in 2018, when we had commercial approval of a CAR-T construct, how many of those patients are not cured by their primary chemotherapy or a stem cell transplant? About 8,000. Some patients won't have insurance, aren't eligible. So it leaves us with 6,800 patients in 2018 who should have been eligible for CAR-T cell therapy. Now you could say, well, so those patients had comorbidities and such, so we'll cut that number in half to 3,400. I just showed you in the real world, in patients with a lot of comorbidities, this therapy was as effective as it was in the clinical trial. So it's not 3,400, it really is 6,800. In 2018, how many patients in the United States received CAR T cell therapy? 700. We did better uh, in 2019 and 2020, but we're still in the upper teens in terms of percentage of patients who should be considered for this potentially curative therapy uh, actually receiving the therapy. This is on the NCCN guidelines and it represents for this population of patients, relapse, refractory, large cell lymphoma, the standard of care in the United States. These patients need to have access. Next slide, please. Where are we going with CAR T cell therapy? Well, an important question is, should we wait until patients have relapse, refractory disease? If it works in that setting, worst case scenario, maybe we should move it earlier on when patients first relapse. And that has been the focus of the Zuma-7 trial, which has accrued over 350 patients. We were one of the lead enrolling sites in the world community uh, to this important clinical trial. And it puts head to head 
autologous stem cell transplant versus CAR T cell therapy and relapse uh, and potentially chemotherapy sensitive diffuse large cell lymphoma. A second trial, which has just completed enrollment and, uh, and to which we were also one of the lead enrolling sites, same uh, similar design, uh, CAR T versus autologous stem cell transplant called the Belinda trial. Uh, and the data and out, uh, outcomes for these trials are pending. But if CAR T cell therapy uh, is uh, better in terms of outcomes, complete responses and durability of response, it will be a paradigm shift away from autologous stem cell transplant. But the jury's out. Next slide, please. Next. Dr. McGurk, um, yes. Ashley Spalding is having some Wi-Fi issues and having trouble advancing for you. There okay. we go. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, what about mantle cell lymphoma? A very aggressive form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can in involve the bloodstream and uh, present itself in a leukemic state uh, in patients. Not, uh, not commonly, but it does. Uh, for those patients who are relatively younger, that is less than 60 years of age, what does the outcome look for the, uh, uh, like for them uh, when they have early progression of disease. And there are a number of therapies that have come to the forefront that are state-of-the-art therapies available for treatment of these patients today. But you can see here too, the majority of patients are expected to succumb from their disease. Next slide, please. So in this context, these data published uh, just this past spring uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, CAR T cell therapy for patients who had relapse, chemotherapy, refractory, mantle cell lymphoma show really quite remarkable progression-free and overall survivals far superior to what I just showed you and what the expectation would be for those patients who had first relapse disease. These patients had a median of three uh, prior regimens. This uh, next, this result also gave rise uh, this past year to FDA approval of CAR T cell therapy for mantle cell lymphoma patients in first relapse. Next slide, please. Follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a disease that patients, many patients can live with for years, some even untreated, but inevitably they require therapy and inevitably they become resistant to therapy uh, and are expected to come to their disease. So in those patients who uh, have had multiple lines of therapy, are no longer responding to chemotherapy. These important data presented at the most recent American Society of Hematology meeting, Zuma 5, show an overall response rate with CAR T cell therapy of 92%, 76% complete remissions. Very encouraging in data, uh, data indeed. And we look forward to potentially an FDA approval in the near future. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the progression free and overall survival associated. Uh, with CAR T cell therapy for these relapsed refractory follicular lymphoma patients. Next slide, please. What about multiple myeloma, another relatively common blood cancer? Uh, these are the expected outcomes, overall survival in the blue curve and in the red curve, um, the uh, 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 progression-free survival. Uh, very poor outcomes expected for these patients, not as precipitous as what we saw with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but nonetheless poor outcomes. Next slide, please. CAR T therapy has been studied here as well with respon overall response rates that range from 20% to 100%. Next. And so I highlight for you what I think is the most promising construct that's up for FDA review. And that is the LCAR construct, 100% uh, overall response rate, 86% complete responses. And all of these patients had failed uh, prior chemotherapy, including autologous stem cell transplants. So greatly encouraging. We have uh, three active CAR T trials and multiple myeloma uh, uh, at KU at this time. Next slide, please. FDA review for CAR T cell therapy underway for multiple myeloma as well. Next slide. And finally, using somebody else's, a young 18 year old T cells who have, uh, that have never been exposed to chemotherapy, never been in the context of cancer might be the optimal strategy uh, to produce these CAR T constructs. And we uh, were the first in the United States at KU Cancer Center to enroll a patient on such a trial uh, in a multi-center, multinational study using CAR T cell therapy from a healthy person who never had cancer uh, for use in a patient with 
uh, these blood cancers that I've been speaking to you about. Next slide, please. So a broad array, and this is really underrepresented in this cartoon uh, that, uh, that, that we put together here about how we've just, we're just at the beginning of this revolution and using the pa patients or someone else's own cells to attack these cancers and using them uh, uh, with different types of gene engineering. It's really spectacular uh, what's going on in the field right now. Next slide, please. In this context, uh, uh, the following uh, cell therapy trials in total, 20 and a number of studies in the pipeline, not just in the blood cancers I've talked about tonight, but in solid tumors as well are currently underway at the Kansas University uh, Cancer Center. It's a very exciting time indeed, very promising future. Next slide, please. Uh, there was one remaining slide that uh, I wanted you to see um, uh, showing you a new uh, hospital tower that we have a 100 bed cell therapy unit, which will house our acute leukemia, our bone marrow transplant and our um, uh, cell therapy uh, program, three floors. One of our uh, patients gave us an extraordinarily generous uh, gift. It's gonna be state of the art. We went around the nation looking at other centers uh, to develop what we uh, believe is going to be uh, second to none in the United States increasing clinical trial availability to our patients is a top priority. We are up for uh, consideration of comprehensive cancer center designation uh, later this year. And I don't want to jinx this, but uh, because of uh, this type of work, work in our research laboratories in the cancer center, work in uh, controlling cancer throughout our state, um, uh, all of these efforts I uh, have a great hope will lead to our comprehensive cancer center designation and bring even more promising research and clinical trials uh, to our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. McGurk, and thank you to all of our speakers. And um, we are running uh, a little long on time and I, I just, so we don't have time uh, for any questions, uh, but certainly if you have any uh, questions or feedback for us, you can reach out to us through our website www.masoniccanceralliance.org. I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, our speakers uh, for sharing their time and expertise with us. It's really remarkable to see uh, all of the advances from you know, kind of the big bombs of chemotherapy that we used to give uh, to really the more elegant uh, treatments that we have developed um, uh, for the diseases we talked about tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, we thank you for your attention and, and for being with us tonight. And this is Hope Crable, and I noticed that there is one question in the chat, and we will send it to Dr. McGurk and forward it to you. So thank you for the question.